News First, Newsline. Hello there, a very good evening and welcome to another edition of Newsline. We're coming to you live and direct from our News First studios here in Colombo. Uh, the economic crisis uh, brought about many realities here in Sri Lanka and one of the um, saddest unfoldings, of course, uh, is the number of deaths that have been attributed due to the lapses in Sri Lanka's health system. Now, Sri Lanka's health system uh, conventionally was known as one of the best, at least in South Asia. Uh, the uh, connectivity among the different strata uh, within the health sector was praised even by the World Health Organization. But where are we today and how fast this collapse happened is, of course, uh, very alarming, concerning and sad to say the least. To discuss these matters and much more, uh, we've got the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Uh, Arya Ratna. A very good evening, doctor, and welcome to the show. Good evening, Shannon. Um, doctor, first things first, um, when it comes to health, that is one thing uh, that a person cannot, should not compromise on. Uh, but in today's context, you see people compromising so much on their health, uh, not because they're complacent or, or, or they are unaware of the situation, but simply because they can't afford their medicine. There is a complete breakdown in the health uh, sector of Sri Lanka. And I don't know if you uh, tuned in to the parliamentary sessions on the no confidence motion against the Minister of Health. Uh, whether or not the Minister of Health uh, was involved in this, is to be blamed for this, is responsible for this, that's a different question entirely. Uh, but just to watch parliamentarians making representations in parliament on behalf of the people with regard to this health crisis was shameful, to say the least, doctor. Uh, so then, when we can't you know, really rely on our leaders, the leaders that we appointed in good faith to um, exercise or to use the sovereignty of the people and govern us, uh, we look at professional bodies like the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Doctor, what has the Sri Lanka Medical Association been doing to bring Sri Lanka's health sector out of this utterly dire state that we're in right now? Yeah, Shalin, and thank you for giving this opportunity to uh, SLM. Um, Sri Lanka Medical Association is a professional medical association. Mm. It's an apex medical association which has the widest representation of all doctors hmm. in the country. And it's an organization with 136 years of existence. Hmm. And our primary objective is, of course, to serve the doctors, to improve their skills and knowledge, and be responsive to the growing demands on the health sector. Hmm. The other objective is to really uh, do policy advocacy work to improve the health conditions of our people. Hmm. Now, you asked me the question, in this crisis, what has SLMA been doing? Hmm. Now, this is not, these are uh, what I may call a poly crisis or a multiple crisis here, hmm. which is uh, uh, manifesting in different ways. Right. What you referred to as the shortages of drugs and medi you know, medical supplies, consumer and The rise in prices also. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. And, and also, it's not just the rise of prices uh, of the medicines, but also the, what you call the out-of-pocket expenditure. Mm. by the public you know now i am sure you you would have also obtained uh, you know health services from the government sector now, i was mm. born in a government hospital mm. and uh, most part of my my life i had uh, obtained uh, state health services okay. right and as you said we have been quite proud of our health system exactly because it was very equitable you know mm. it it served all segments of our society mm. whether they belong to the low lower socio-economic class or different ethnicity so it was a equitable fair healthcare system mm. so we all know that it had deficiencies i mean there were drug shortages shortages mm. of doctors but those were not systemic problems the mm. system as a whole was really working mm. but we have seen very unfortunately past couple of years not just due to covid but because of bad management what we call health governance. Of course, that also is part of the bad governance that is there in, in a larger context in this country. So, who is responsible for the governance of the health sector, if I may ask, doctor? So, the state, it's not just the health ministry, but mm. of course, the larger governance, you know, if, if there is no control of corruption in the state system, it affects the health care system as well, right? So, you have to enforce law. There are certain regulations that need to be adhered to. Hmm. And if these are not being adhered to and not taken seriously by the, uh, the, 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 the politicians who are, you know, responsible for these sectors. 
as well as the administrators, then we are in this kind of pathetic situation. Hmm. So, uh, the COVID-19 in 2020 and 2022 had a big impact on the health system, but hmm. our health system was quite robust and the doctors hmm. were prepared and they responded very positively. Even this the World Health Organization commended, commended the system on our, Exactly. So, what happened was uh, the, uh, the economic crisis uh, of course, uh, put um, uh, greater pressure on the healthcare system because we did not have enough uh, you know foreign currency to buy medicines and mm. all that. So, SLMA at the very beginning, we, we knew that these shortages were going to happen. Mm. As early as April last year, 2022, the SLMA alerted the then president, Gotabe Rajapaksha, that this situation is going to come. We are okay for the moment, but in six months time, we will have a severe problem right hmm. and to streamline and as uh, SLMA we also was part of the solution. We know that you know we have to alert the doctors about uh, optimal use of existing resources, hmm. minimize wastages you know hmm. and that kind of discipline has to be brought to the medical community as well. Hmm. So, we did a lot of things and also uh, introducing some uh, uh, clinical uh, regimes, re cl clinical protocols hmm. that would be more effective in terms of reducing costs right. and also not ordering unnecessary, I am not saying that even in routine practice they do unnecessary ordering of tests, but rationalizing hmm. in a situation where you have resource constraints, you can you can actually choose which one to be uh, carried out on a uh, in a uh, given patient. So, hmm. that kind of uh, extensive training modules all that were disseminated by the SLMA. Then co continue to advocate with the policy makers, with the hmm. president, the, the health minister at that time. Uh, and particularly on the procurement of medicines and also when there was that like these shortages as an interim measure all the professional colleges you know college of surgeons, college of physicians, college of pediatricians, college of obstetrics and gynecology all got together and identified what were the urgently need, needed medicines even mm. for uh, treatment of cancer patients mm. and then as a stopgap measure they uh, went ahead and uh, you know got donations following of course the procedure you know all the registered drugs and you know was somehow buffering the the mitigate to mitigate the, this negative impact on the uh, health system hmm. but of course what we had seen is that then uh, uh, they were saying that there was no not enough money but we met the fi finance uh, ministry officials hmm. and they said no we are giving priority to the he health sector hmm. it's ho how you prioritize within the allocated budget on what medicines to uh, be imported. So, what unfortunately happened was that the National Medicine and uh, Regulatory Authority NMRA was not really functioning optimally. Hmm. For example, even the board positions were not uh, filled hmm. and the critical ones uh, where you need the representation of professional colleges, right. They were filled only after SLMA made uh, representations directly to the president and put pressure on the government to fill these vacancies. Hmm. Then there were also uh, non-adherence to the given procedures in the NMRA Act. Hmm. For example, wavering of registration. Emergency purchases. Emergency purchases. There was a procedure for that. Of course, it is allowed, but not in very specific conditions, you know, hmm. not, not this kind of crisis as they interpret. Hmm. So, it became the norm rather than the routine practice. Rather than the exception. The exception became, became the norm. The norm, exactly. Uh, so, Doctor, now when we speak of um, a crisis, usually in the health sector or whichever sector, it's the main professionals, the professional bodies in that sector that really steps up. Um, you, we are all currently experiencing a governing crisis, uh, but uh, during the height of this governing crisis, especially uh, when matters of constitutional importance came up, we saw um, the Bar Association of Sri Lanka stepping up and, and fighting uh, to ensure that the trust or the faith that the people have placed in the judiciary, in the legal system of Sri Lanka is not tainted and that continues forward because that is important to us as a society. Now we are facing a situation where people's trust, people's faith in the health sector of the country is at stake, is uh, tarnished, is compromised. Um, so against such a backdrop, doctor, uh, what really uh, are is the SLMA doing, especially, let me take a few examples. Uh, for instance, there were several deaths that were attributed to the use of several drugs. Those batches were suspended um, and steps were taken in that way. Uh, there were representations made 
uh, by the directors of these hospitals that this was uh, an allergic reaction to that drug. And I, I do concede the fact that usually during a crisis, some small incidents that would otherwise go unnoticed become huge, massive national issues. But let's take, for example, uh, the incident that happened uh, at the eye hospital, where several people who went to get a routine cataract surgery done um, lost their sight, doctor. They lost their sight. And at a time like that, you see the health minister and members of the government coming out and saying, uh, the opposition is trying to taint the trust of the people in the health sector of the country. Uh, they are making statements in a way that people will not go to a hospital even if they are sick because, you know, they're so scared. But when these kind of things happen, doctor, can the people react in any other way, really? Yeah, so I think uh, you gave the answer also that the, the politicization of the entire issue, I think is the most unfortunate thing. Now, there is a, there is a fact that is there, there had been deaths. Of course, without proper investigation, you can't attribute it to a particular cause, although this uh, anaphylaxic reaction or you know the, the allergic reaction can be attributed. But uh, right now, the most important aspect is the, the confidence of the people, the yes. loss of confidence. That is a serious matter because over for a long time, the the confidence in the health system has been built. No, I mm. mean it's a, a and and also about immunization, you know, yes. vaccination. So once you lose the confidence of the people, the trust in the system, it's very very difficult to restore it. Mm. So we we knew that from the beginning. Now you asked about the uh, the trust in the judiciary. Now we also did go. We took first step as early as uh, March this year. Mm. We filed uh, a case at the Human Rights Commission mm -hmm. regarding the, the, the shortages of medicines and the, uh, this uh, procedure not mm -hmm. being followed. Mm -hmm. So, we had two hearings and it's, uh, the case is still going on. Mm -hmm. Then with our representatives, there were also public interest groups which, right. are, which went to the Supreme Courts mm -hmm. and then got an injunction and then now that case will be here, uh, will be heard uh, uh, in, in October. Right. So, we have also been like part of that uh, th those uh, initiatives as well while also working on the uh, solutions. So, now how to correct this? Correct, uh, now if you look at the NMR Act, mm -hmm. it's a, it, it, you do not need to amend that. Now, there is a committee to, uh, to uh, committee appointed to again look at uh, how, how this can be, you know, amended. amended uh, it's, it's, it's purely because of misinterpretation of the Act or the provisions therein that would allow an easier route yeah. uh, to, you know, probably give a few tenders to those close companies to you. That's 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 the question. Yeah, also, right? also there are of course resource constraints. Now, for example, laboratory testing. Hmm. So, post event testing is not the answer. Hmm. I mean, you have other procedures. These are these are there's an ecosystem to to ensure quality. It starts from the governance, the appointment of uh, proper individuals to those positions to having pharmacists and other technical personnel mm. uh, appointed to the authority, then also having laboratories uh, which are fully equipped and so on. Mm. So, it, it, I, I think you have to look at the entire system and then try to uh, improve. And also in the act, there is a national advisory committee that needed to be appointed. But That's that wasn't another, appointed. No, it was never appointed. I think it was appointed at the uh, time that it was, uh, in MRA was uh, the act was uh, enacted in 2000. Uh, 15, hmm. uh, but then that committee I was made to understand never met. So, after 3 years it lapses. Hmm. So, now I think I have been also telling this to the uh, to the authorities that uh, as SLMA we would like the National Advisory Committee of the NMRA be uh, appointed and that has not happened because that is another additional oversight. But, so, but Doctor, yeah. is, is the government, the authorities that be really, you know, listening to the views, the concerns of the SLMA on a scale of 1 to 10, how happy are you about the response that you've got to the requests, the concerns raised by the SLMA? Uh, if I rate, I'll say 5 out of 10 because at least… <laughs> You're on the fence, are you? Doctor? No, no, no. I mean, it's just that it's more on the, on the negative side. I mean, that's a fact. Then it so should be a 4. Only, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. 
<laughs> so you can say it's four. Four. Uh, I mean, uh, five is not acceptable. Even half is not acceptable. But uh, so you the, have uh, very high standards, doctor. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, the 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 fact is that it's not just SLMA. There had been other professional uh, bodies which have been, uh, you know, uh, telling these, uh, uh, discussing these issues and making recommendations. Mm. So uh, there is some kind of impunity. Also, we can do anything we like. So that is very unfortunate. And also the uh, the uh, the interpretation of whatever you know being uh, told with, with with evidence, you know, sometimes they are disregarded. So that's the sad thing. So we have to keep pressing. This is this is why I say that it's about governance, nothing else. So uh, how much can we do? I mean, we are in a situation where you know we don't have any elections uh, <laughs> in sight, and so uh, they can uh, the the. Politicians can can uh, do whatever they want, which is very unfortunate. So this lack of accountability is a very serious matter, and we are you know uh, dealing with uh, human lives. That's the difference here. So I think uh, we need to have more public discourse on this, and then public need to put pressure. At the same time, I think uh, as public, uh, I think they should also take uh, lot of precautions now to try to maintain their health. Do health promotion work, preventive work, and uh, also have uh, more responsible uh, behavior, so that you minimize the the, the uh, impact uh, on the health sector as well. Because mm. if you take, for example, the uh, road accidents, if you have seen the last couple of months, large numbers, no. So it is reckless driving. The law is not enforced. So multiple factors, mm. and it's the number one cause of hospital admissions in Sri Lanka. Uh, traffic accidents, uh, road traffic accidents, and and uh, violence, trauma, which are very unfortunate. And there's a when there's a shortage of medicines, particularly surgical, you know, uh, reagents and uh, supplies, uh, most of these admissions require immediate uh, surgical intervention. So mm. just imagine the cost for this uh, for the system, and with also the migration of doctors, particularly you know uh, specialties like anesthesia and so on. It's having a it's it compounds the situation, so I think we are as uh, your uh, topic suggests we are at the verge of collapse of mm. a system. So we have to do everything to prevent that from happening. So that's the urgency of the matter. So, Doctor, what really is the future for Sri Lanka's health sector now? We are staring um, at the light from the bottom of the barrel. Where do we go next? What do you see is the next immediate step that needs to be taken to ensure that this system that is just falling apart around us doesn't really flatten yeah. the entire system? So, first is that we adhere to whatever the regulations that are there and try to somehow address the shortages of medicine and also in uh, <coughs> confirm to the quality quality standards there are mechanisms to do that it's mm. all very it's clear it's they are black and white so you have to follow the procedures so the government so that is that would mainly be the concern of the nmra nmra plus the procurement procedures okay. you know because it's by the msd and, and that whole system has to be more efficient and then also minimize wastage. There is a lot of wastage in our system, you know, mm. and uh, so address those. Then the, the next, of course, priority is how to stop these, our health personnel from migrating mm. to other countries. So here, I think we have to look at what are the pull factors, what are the push factors. Push factors we can address, you know, there are, uh, of course, the re remunerations and all the benefits given to doctors. There are disparities, you know, some some grades can, you know, be okay with uh, what they are receiving. But on the average, our doctors need more facilities, more mm. incentives to particularly those who are working in the periphery. They are making huge sac sacrifice and, you know, their children's education, all those things. Mm. Then the tax regime has also caused lot of concern and uh, mm. it is affecting uh, you know those younger doctors mm. who are you know trying to you know set up their families you know construct a house and all those things so you have to look at very sympathetically what are the factors that are making doctors to think of migrating to other countries right mm. then also uh, strict enforcement of some of the say bonds that are uh, being uh, made to uh, for foreign uh, the, the doctors who go for, for foreign trainings, mm -hmm. if they don't return, uh, you know there's a bond. Mm -hmm. Enforcement is not happening, so that you know at least it's a deterrent 
for them to be uh, not honoring hmm. these uh, these commitments. Usually, doctor, what what is the content of these bonds? I'm I'm purely yeah. asking you because I'm unaware yeah. of uh, how it's that a, it's really a simply works. simply a, a financial. There's a amount, and you know you have so, to. So so does it does it work that the doctor deposits that certain amount? In, in, a, in a bank account of the government and then leaves? No, no, no. It it, it, if it is it's deposited, then it's easy. To it's a surety. It's a yeah. surety. Yeah, no, but uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a document, it's a contract which, uh, uh, which pledges that... Uh, no, so if the, if the doctor went to, uh, migrates overseas and then takes his family, who are going to enforce thing. it against No, you can. You can still enforce because I think there are uh, also ways that some have paid. And of course, the other problem is that you have, you know, there is a, there is a code of ethics co code of uh, uh, you know practice that is uh, adhered to by all who me member countries mm. uh, on uh, health personnel migration mm. right so the recipient countries uh, have to be con conscious of the the uh, the negative impact it's going to have on the uh, low income countries who are uh, producing producing the doctors. these doctors, hmm. so that's not happening. So I think the government. So why is that not happening, doctor? Is there any way that our government can intervene and and, and seek assistance from these international organizations? Absolutely can, but, but that is not happening. No, that's not happening, and more than the, 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 that, uh, the uh, government encouraged professionals to leave, which included uh, doctors last year. Why was There's that? A, uh, to give uh, you know to, to get back more, more dollars. Yes, of course. So that was not a wise decision, <laughs> no, because. Uh, but, but Doctor, this 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 is this is quite news for me. I mean, I mean, the government did encourage people to seek, you know, employment overseas. But I've I've, I've never really heard uh, the government coming out and saying that we are encouraging doctors or professionals to go overseas. Was that the case? No, no it's a it's a blanket. Uh, 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 provision for all government uh, servants for you know can take leave and then uh, go abroad. So that included uh, doctors professionals well. like doctors. Hmm. Yeah. So so uh, there are many things that you could do, and also uh, because the the you know uh, Ministry of Finance and you know the bilateral and multilateral donors, mm -hmm. the development partners are committed to help Sri Lanka at this point. Mm. So I don't think there's a resource constraint. We have to get our act together and plan and then uh, identify where the uh, urgent problems are. Otherwise, mm. now there are many hospitals where they are closing down even uh, ICUs because there are no um, these uh, anesthetists and other uh, specialists are uh, not there. Even pediatric units, yesterday we heard uh, that uh, one uh, teaching hospital there that unit was closed because the uh, doctor retired the, the, the specialist retired. pediatrician retired and the, there was no replacement so uh, it's a very unfortunate situation because uh, we will see in couple of months time or maybe a few years time how these uh, uh, avoidable deaths these are all preventable deaths no i mean it's a crime and and we can't as a as a nation which values human lives we can't let this continue so that is why I think it's a collective responsibility, and the government really needs to uh, look into this way without uh, further delay, and uh, involve organisations like the SLMA and other professional colleges, and also the public interest groups try to address this problem. Uh, the the resources, additional resources could be mobilised even through donations. There are, I mean, we personally know that uh, there are many organisations who would at least for the next. Uh, Six to um, six months to nine months, who are willing to supply certain substantial uh, quantities of uh, medicines, which mm. are approved medicines from uh, reputed suppliers. So now there is a mechanism, and also actually SLMA did quite a bit of lobbying, mm. and also uh, we have an intercollegiate committee. That mm. is, uh, we have about forty different uh, uh, colleges uh, uh, in the health sector, uh, medical sector, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, with that committee, we helped the health ministry to come up with the essential drugs list, which was mm -hmm. more than thousand earlier, and it's now about eight hundred and sixty, I think. And uh, also the, the priority lists and the quantities all were worked out. Those were the hard work that uh, colleges uh, and the SLMA did, mm -hmm. so to to help uh, overcome this situation. So we have to continue our efforts, and we'll see that uh, these uh, 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 our decision makers take uh, these uh, recommendations seriously and act on them. Uh, uh, doctor, according to your assessment, um, the health sector of the country, uh, you know, where does it stand now, uh, as compared to maybe 
uh, this time about six months ago, is it is it tilting towards the better? Is it still on the fence? Is it hard to say? No, I think it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It, it's getting worse, absolutely. Because now, last year seven hundred doctors left this country. This year we don't know the exact number, because some doctors leave uh, without even uh, you know uh, resigning. So even the ministry doesn't know. So they are just vacating uh, the post, which is also unethical. But at the same time, when you look at uh, uh, the issue from uh, the doctor's uh, perspective, then uh, they also have valid reasons for that. So we are we are in a serious situation. So uh, I mean, six months ago, I think we didn't have uh, uh, closure of uh, units, treatment units, hospital units, uh, teaching hospital units. But now it's happening. So uh, that's why I say that we are the situation is getting worse. So, uh, doctor, just one final question: Is is the government aware of these units closing down? Do they have a team monitoring how bad the situation is getting? What's the progress? Yes. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, they are very well uh, known to the administrators. They know, and they are also probably, uh, you know, our uh, health administrators are also trying to, you know, uh, mitigate by sometimes uh, referring some of these specialists to look after other other hospitals but it's not it's not sustainable it can't last long you you can i mean a, a specialist can cover two or three hospitals but that's not the solution because you, with the patient load you can't mm. uh, give uh, do justice to the patient so we have to find long lasting solutions that could come only by sincere efforts putting this uh, as the priority that saving lives is important resourcing the health sector is important collective uh, efforts are uh, required here and even the trade unions are willing to cooperate they have a uh, you know uh, proposals given very mm. positive proposals given even by organizations like the government medical officers association so i think that's enough and more um, uh, solutions that have been proposed hmm. it's only the in the implementation 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 then we can overcome this situation thank you very much uh, dr arya ratna president of the sri lanka medical association and of course during these grim times that our country is facing uh, not only in the health sector but uh, across all other uh, aspects here in the country but especially the health sector uh, doctor we wish you and the slma all the best to uh, you know push for uh, a better health system here in Sri Lanka, or at least uh, to rebuild from what's left of the health sector here in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ari Ratna, for joining us on our show. Thank you for inviting. And thank you very much to all our viewers out there for tuning in, as you always do. Until we meet again, take care and God bless.